Well, Easter is a time celebrating victory. We remember on Good Friday the cross and the suffering of Jesus, but we remember on Easter the resurrection and the victory of Jesus Christ. And so I want to just remind you of what we talked about on Good Friday and that you think about on Good Friday that there's times where victory seems impossible. There's moments in life where you look and say, there's no way this is turning out good. There's no way this is spinning for the better. Victory looks impossible. And so on Good Friday, I shared a couple of stories that I promised you I would finish here on Easter Sunday. And so first I told you about uh, August 29th, 1986. I haven't been to very many professional baseball games, but I happened to be at a baseball game with some friends of mine in, at the Anaheim Stadium, and we were having the fun of watching the Angels be absolutely crushed by the Detroit Tigers. Uh, they were just getting kind of smacked around. So by the ninth inning, it was 12 to 5. They were down by seven runs. Victory looked impossible. So what do you do when you're at a big stadium and there's lots of cars in the parking lot and it's going to be slow getting out and your team's getting crushed? You start packing up and leaving because victory looked impossible. So we started packing up our stuff and we, we were kind of walking out. And even as we were walking up the stairs, remember there was this one crack. We turned and looked, there's a hit. Ah, yeah, but they're down by seven. We keep going. We're going outside and, and there, then at the uh, Anaheim Stadium, we'd go back and these kind of these ramps back and forth, back and forth, going down outside. And a couple of different times we heard the crowds erupt in cheers and the people that were left. A lot of people had left, had, were gone. But we heard you know, cheers and we're like, ah, there's no, it's impossible. We get in the car, turn on the game. So here's what happened over the next little while as we were driving. Uh, one run for the Angels, two runs for the Angels, three runs for the Angels, four runs for the Angels. They're only three runs away from having a chance to win. Three to tie, four to win. They get one man on base, second man on base. The Tigers walk the third person to load the bases so there's an out at any base. And, and a guy by the name of Dick Schofield, who was a shortstop for the Angels, gets up to bat. Bases are loaded. First pitch, doesn't even swing, strike. Second pitch, takes a cut at it, strike two. Third pitch, goes after it, crack, goes, 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 left field fence, walk off grand slam, the angels win, and we're in a car driving on the freeway. <laughs> we missed it. We got to hear it on the radio. See, victory seemed impossible, but sometimes when victory seems impossible, it happens, and in those moments, it's time to celebrate. And so I try to think, what are, what's a little fun celebration thing? I'm really big on pyrotechnics here, so watch this, what I put together. I got this. Ready? You ready? Here's, so they win, and you go, you go, you ready? Oh, got you guys front row there. And so look, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, sometimes victory happens when it looks impossible. Second story. Young guy named Barry Bermania. Barry was a star athlete. He was a state-level wrestler and a part of the church that Sherry and I led in Michigan years ago. And Barry uh, was hanging out with his friends, high school age uh, student, and hanging out with his friends, and they're hanging out in, in the friend's truck. He's standing in the back of the truck. His friend doesn't know he's standing up and hits the gas. And Barry flips out of the truck and falls in the back of his head. And from that moment on, victory looked impossible. Day after day after day, worse and worse news. His, his parents, Jim, uh, Jim and Pam, are praying. Um, and his, his, his brothers, Chad and Joey, are praying. The whole church is praying. People are visiting, praying for him. He is worse and worse and worse and worse. And finally, after a whole long process, the doctors were watching him, watching for brain activity, movement in the eyes, anything. They finally came to Jim and Sue, and they just said, um, they said, Barry's gone. There's no brain activity left. He's, he's gone. And Barry had actually signed a thing on his license saying that if anything were to happen to him, they could use his vital organs to give life to other people for transplants. So the doctor said, can we begin that process? And they said, can you wait till the morning? We want to tell Chad and we want to tell Joey and talk with them and walk with them and kind of grieve ourselves. We'll come back in the morning. So they just kept him on life support. And we'll come back in the morning and we'll sign the paperwork. So Jim and Sue come back the next day. And the doctor says... This never happens, but he's back. Brain activity is back. Victory looked impossible. It was over from every human standpoint. And every Christmas, we get a card from the Romania family, from Jim and Sue, and this Christmas, we get this beautiful big card with all three of the boys, and here's Barry and his wife and his three kids. He didn't just... Live. He lived. So I was thinking, okay, this is exciting. Okay, we're going to go here. All right? And then 
It's a big one. So we're going to add this. Do you remember the World Cup uh, when, when they, these were driving everybody crazy? Okay. So big celebration, right? But there's one more story I started on Good Friday. And that's the story of Jesus. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Victory looks impossible from a human standpoint. Nailed to the cross, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, nailed to a cross to bear our sins, to take our shame. And on that cross, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the Bible says, and he breathed his last. And Jesus died. All the victory people were hoping for seemed dead on the cross. A soldier comes and thrusts a spear in his side, and it goes through his side and through the sack around the heart and into the heart, so water and blood come gushing out. He's dead. They put him in a tomb. And for one day, two days, three days, he's gone. Victory looked impossible until the third day, until Easter Sunday. And Christ arose again from the dead. And he who was dead came back to life. And he conquered sin and death and the grave and hell. And that celebration, I got thinking about that. That, you know, this is nice. That was a good one, wasn't it? The wind's moving that way. All right. And you could add some of this. But I was telling our, I was telling our worship team and our tech team what, about the service. I said, but I feel like I want something bigger than that. I want something like worthy of Easter. This isn't big enough. And so two of our tech guys, and if you don't know Dale and Michael, they're not like guys that are jumping up in the front and, and in the limelight. They kind of hang in the back a little bit. And, but they both, when I started talking about this concept of doing something bigger, they, they, they go, could, could, could we do something for Easter? Could we come up with something that would be like a big celebration? And, and have you ever seen a, a lab, a Labrador, when they get excited, their, their tail starts wagging? There. Well, these guys look like, like can, can, we, can we be in charge? Can we do something? They get all excited. I said, sure. So here's what we're going to do. They put something a little together for you to celebrate the resurrection. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go count down three, two, one. We're all going to yell, he is risen. And after that, they're going to show you what they put together for you. Okay? A little better than what I did. And if you're in the front and your ears are sensitive, after we yell, he is risen, you might want to plug your ears. Okay? So here we go. Three, two, one. He is risen. Everybody ready? Three, two, one. He is risen. There you go. So you, you let the tight. See, good, good things happen when you let the tech guys get involved <laughs> and give them a little bit of freedom. So on the cross, Jesus died and took our sins. Uh, After three days, victory looked impossible, and yet Jesus came back to life again. And so the question is, what does this victory mean? What does the resurrection of Jesus mean? What does this victory mean? And I want to give you a little concept, and the concept is simply this. What's yours is mine, mine, what's mine is yours. You ever heard that? What's yours is mine, what's mine is yours. You get married. If you get married, what's yours is mine, what's mine is yours. Something happens there. When, when, when a loved one passes away, if they leave an inheritance, what was theirs that they worked a lifetime for becomes yours. There's times when what's, what's yours becomes mine, what's mine becomes yours. Well, at the cross and at the resurrection and the empty tomb, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said this, what's yours is now mine, and what's mine is now yours. When Jesus rose from the dead, when he died on the cross, here's what he said, what's yours is mine. Here's what Jesus says, all your sins, all your wrongs, all your judgment, all your guilt, all your shame. Jesus says this, on the cross and at the empty tomb, what's yours is now mine. Jesus, I take it on myself. And then Jesus says, what's mine is yours. My victory, my power, my grace, my hope. Jesus says, I give all that to you. That's the great exchange. What's yours can become Jesus's if you come to the cross and you receive him and receive his resurrection as your own. And you begin to walk in his victory. And the good things that are his become ours through his grace. It's amazing. When Jesus died on the cross, when he was buried in the grave, and when he rose again, he won the ultimate victory. And he offers that victory. He says, what is mine is yours. Jesus, I offer you my victory. So we have to understand, what is the victory at the resurrection? What was it that Jesus was victorious over that he offers to you and offers to me? So here's the first thing. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was victorious over more than we recognize. There's so many things. We say, well, he he died, he rose, he wins. True. But what does that mean? Listen to this passage from Matthew 28. This is just a simple resurrection story. But listen to this with fresh new ears and open heart. 
after the Sabbath, at dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, I love this, rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel rolls back the stone and sits on it. Right? His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. They're terrified. An angel, the, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. When Jesus died on the cross, when he rose again, he won the ultimate final victory, and he offers that victory to anyone who will receive it. He doesn't force it on people. He doesn't. Jesus does not force himself or his victory on anyone, but he offers it to everyone, to all who will receive it. And so what was this victory of Jesus when he came out of the tomb on Easter Sunday? And what is this victory that we can receive if we receive him and walk with him? Well, here's the first thing. Jesus was victorious over sin and shame. And he offers that victory to us. He was victorious over sin and shame. All of our sins, all of our wrongs, the things we thought that we wish we hadn't thought, the things we've said that we know we shouldn't have said, the things we've done that we know we shouldn't have done, whether it's as a kid or as an adult, it doesn't matter. The good things we should have done that we just go, didn't want to do it. All those sins against God, this perfect God. Jesus says, I have victory over that. On the cross, he took our sins. And he took our shame. The shame we carry for what we've done. Jesus says, I'll take it all in my victory. And give you that victory. Listen to these words from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you take the victory of Jesus, if you walk with Jesus, no condemnation. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life and has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, listen to this, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, to be a sin offering. On the cross, Jesus paid for our sins. He destroyed our shame. And when he rose from the dead, he proved that it was all true. When you walk in the victory of Jesus, your sin and your shame are gone. Why? Because we're so good? No, because he took it on himself on the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 20, we read these words. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. When you know Jesus, God lets the world know about him through you. And this says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, listen to this, be reconciled, healed in relationship, be reconciled to God. Because God made him, Jesus, because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you catch what's going on there? God says, what's yours through Jesus Christ, what's yours is mine. Your sin, your judgment, your shame. He says, I take it all. My righteousness, I give to you. That's, that's staggering. That's amazing. Do you understand that at the resurrection of Jesus, that's what we're being told. That's his victory that he offers to us. So when we receive and walk in his victorious presence, we live in his righteousness and without condemnation. You can live all your life in the right, you know, clothed in the righteousness of Christ with no condemnation. Why? Because Jesus paid the price. Because he died on the cross and he rose again. That is staggering. Jesus was also victorious over Satan and hell. And he offers us that victory. There's a lot of evil in the world. You don't have to look very far to see the evil in the world. You don't have to look very far to see the evil in our own hearts at times. And yet Jesus came to deal with that also. In Romans chapter 8, beginning of verse 37, we read these words. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Get it? Through his victory, through his conquering, we become conquerors. He gives that to us. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons... 
neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, listen to this, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He offers us his love. He offers us his grace. He overcomes Satan. He overcomes sin on our behalf. So when we walk, when we receive and walk in his victorious presence, no spiritual power or evil has authority in our life. Do you know that when you walk in the victory of Jesus, there's no power of evil in this world that has power over you? Satan can from the outside try to harass you, but he can't get on the inside. You know why? Because you get filled up with the Holy Spirit when you become a Christian, and you're protected from that. So you walk in that victory, and you walk in that power, and you walk in that strength. And you can say, nope, that's not my life anymore. I'm becoming this kind of person through the presence and the power of Jesus. When Jesus was victorious, when he rose from the dead, a lot of things happened. Here's another one. Jesus was victorious over death and the grave. Over death and the grave. Probably the, the greatest things, that, the thing that causes the most fear for most people. When will my life end? I'm going to die someday. But Jesus won victory over death and the grave and opened heaven for all who put their faith in him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Beginning in verse 55, we read these words. And in 1 Corinthians 15, almost the whole chapter is about the resurrection of Jesus. And because of his resurrection, the fact that we will not die through faith in him, we'll be raised with him. And we can walk in that confidence and live in that confidence. So in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 55, we read these words. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. Jesus dealt with that. And the power of the sin, sin is the law. Listen to these words. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hear that? He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, he gives us his victory through Jesus Christ. So when we receive and walk in his victorious presence, our today and our eternity are secure because death is not the end of the story. Do you know that if you come to the cross and you receive Jesus Christ, you put your faith in him? That the end of this life is not the end of life. It's the beginning. of something that is far better and far more glorious than we can imagine or we can dream. It's interesting, when I became a Christian, and I've shared this before at Shoreland, but when I became a Christian, I just had this idea that I, would, I wouldn't live to be 30. And here's why. I started reading about all these young Christian men through history who had lived for Jesus and who died before they were 30. I heard about Jim Elliott, this uh, guy who actually graduated from the college I went to in, in Illinois, Wheaton, Illinois, and he had gone to South America to bring the gospel, and the people he brought the gospel to killed him. But he followed Jesus, and he died. I read about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor in Germany who resisted the Nazi, what the Nazis were doing, and he was killed. So I read about these different passionate young Christian men who lived for Jesus, and they, so I just figured, I won't live to be 30. And Sherry and I got married before that, but I thought, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see. And then I turned 30. And I actually thought, well, I probably won't live to be 40. I'm just going to live for Jesus, pour it out, give everything I have, and I probably won't live to be 40. Then I turned 40. And I probably won't live to be 50. I, this really went through my mind. I said, I probably won't live to be 50. I'm just going to pour myself out for, I mean, I love Sherry. I love my kids, but it's like, I want to you know, be with Jesus someday. I'm not worried about it. I'll live for Jesus, and if I die, that's fine. Then I turned 50. Now I'm creeping to the edge of 60. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still around, apparently, as far as I can tell, I'm still around. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I look and say, but you know, I don't worry about the end of this life because I know that's the beginning of a better life. But I got a buddy named Ken Corver. Ken is a pastor down in Los Angeles. His church does services in like five or six different languages, and they're going to be having a bunch of services today. But Ken and I talk and pray together regularly. He's been a friend since seminary. And so Ken, Ken and I were talking one day, we were just going to go to, we we're going to pray together. So we started praying, and as he's praying, Ken prayed this prayer that as he prayed it, just almost like caught my, I caught my breath, I, thought, I hadn't even thought this way, but here's what he prayed. He said, God, I pray that Kevin will be a spiritual influence on his children's children's children. And during prayer, my mind went, okay, I got three boys, a couple grandkids, they're their kids. And I thought, then I'd have to be like 80 or 90. <laughs> I don't know if I'll, I know I'm not going to go at 30, 40, or 50. Um, I don't know when this life ends. I don't know if I will get to influence my children's children's children. But here's what Jesus tells me. I'll never die. 
I will be with him forever. That the moment this life ends, a new life begins with him. Because Jesus won the victory through his resurrection and he offers it to us. And grave and death should leave no fear if you walk in the victory of Jesus. If you understand what he's done for you. We can walk in that confidence. And then Jesus was victorious when he rose from the dead over fear and uncertainty. So many people today live with so much fear and so much uncertainty. But Jesus rose from the dead to say, I can conquer even that. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, we read these words. I, Jesus, so Jesus is speaking. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. I love that. Then he says this, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Listen to this. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. The free gift of the water of life. We don't have to have uncertainty or fear because Jesus says, I offer you life, the water of life. And you know, the thing about Jesus is he doesn't force people. He doesn't force anyone to believe in him. He offers himself to everyone. And, and sometimes Christians can be pushy and want to force things on people. I don't think that's the right thing. I think we should be just like Jesus. We offer what Jesus has offered and tell people what Jesus has done. And so today I want to give an invitation as we pray together. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you have come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, if you know that he's risen and he's alive in your life and he's working within you, I want to pray with you that you would say, Jesus, let me walk in the strength of your victory with greater confidence, greater boldness, that I would be fearless and know that sin and shame and death and the hell and the enemy do not have to intimidate me because I walk in your victory. I'm going to pray for you that you would walk in that victory. And then I want to pray for anyone who says, you know what? I've never come to that place where I've said, yes, I receive Jesus. I call him my savior. And I want to invite you today to come and drink for the free gift of the water of life. And understand that Jesus says, what's yours is mine. I will take all your wrongs, all your sin, all your brokenness. Jesus said, I, I took it on the cross. I'll take it from you. And Jesus will say, what's mine is yours. My victory, my hope, my grace are yours now and forever. Jesus, this is our prayer today. We pray that we would understand the glory and the power of your victory. And so right now, I want to ask all of you who are at home, all of you who are in your cars, everyone in the courtyard, if you've come to the cross, if you receive Jesus, you know you are his child, you are his follower. Will you right now just join me in this prayer and say, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your victory. Thank you for dying on the cross, paying the price, conquering sin and death and hell and shame for me. Thank you, Jesus, for rising again from the dead for this Easter celebration, remembering your resurrection. And will you dare to pray this prayer? Jesus, give me greater boldness with every passing day to walk in your victory, to walk in your power, to take your hand, to follow you closely, and to live in the victorious resurrection power of you, Jesus Christ, my Savior. If you prayed that prayer right now as a follower of Jesus, he takes delight in that and he wants to unleash new power in your life. And I want to pray for anyone who would say right now, and maybe you're in, in one of the cars here, you're in the courtyard, maybe you're at home online, and you say, you know what, this whole Jesus thing is new to me. I don't understand all of it, but I understand enough to say, Jesus, I want to receive you, your death on the cross and your resurrection and your victory, your payment for all my wrongs. And I want to say, Jesus, what's mine, all my brokenness, all my sin, all my wrong, Jesus, if you would take it from me, I give it to you. And Jesus, would you give to me your victory and take my hand and lead me all the days of my life? If that's your desire right now, I want to ask you to pray right now, just quietly between you and Jesus in your heart, wherever you are. Would you just in your heart say this? Say, dear Lord Jesus, I don't have everything figured out, but I know that I want to have a relationship with you. I want you, Jesus, to take away all my wrongs and all my sins and all my guilt and all my shame. Jesus, what's mine, if you would take it, could become yours and you would take those things from me. And Jesus, would you give me what you have earned that I didn't earn, but I receive as a gift from you because you came to, you came to give me this gift. 
Jesus, I receive your victory. I receive your power and your presence in my life. I receive forgiveness for my sins. And I call you the leader of my life. And now, Jesus, I will take your hand and for all the days of my life and for all of eternity, I will follow you as the victorious Lord of all. And Jesus, for all of us, thank you for the blessing of this day. Thank you for the beauty of being able to gather together in homes and cars in the courtyard, but to be here together. And just as you're keeping your heart in a place of prayer, I want to give one more invitation. And that is, if you prayed today for the first time to receive Jesus, if you said, Jesus, I pr I'm praying right now that you would take all my wrong, my, what's mine is yours, take my wrong, my sin, my shame, and I want to receive your victory. If you prayed that prayer to Jesus today, I want to ask you to do one thing. If you're in the courtyard, when you leave today, at all of the exits, there's going to be a pastor or my wife, Sherry, there's, they're going to have a table with Bibles on it. As you leave, would you pick up one of those Bibles? It's, it's a modern Bible, not these and thous. It's a Bible you can understand. It's the same one we use here at Shoreline. Would you pick up a Bible? And in that Bible is a letter from me and is a 50-day reading plan to teach you how to read the Bible and also some different ways you can start to grow in your faith. Would you pick up one of those Bibles? And on the top of the Bible is a little card and a pen. And it's just three questions. What's your name, phone number, email, so that we can contact you and help you start to grow in your faith. That's all we want to do is help you take the next step in faith. When you get that Bible, as you pick that up when you leave, take that, fill out that information, and put it in the basket on the table. If you're in the parking lot, as you pull out, if you prayed for the first time, you're going to pass a little table with Pastor David there, and if you just raise your hand out your window, uh, he'll bring a Bible right to you, and if you do the same, fill out that card, that would be great. We want to follow up with you. And if you're online, would you right now, that you see a number on the screen right now, a phone number, would you text the word victory to that number? What that means is that you prayed today to receive Jesus, and then we want to follow up. When you text that, we're going to send you a note, and you can tell us where to send you your Bible, and we're going to find a way to build a bridge to get to know you and help you start to grow in your faith. If you would take that step, it will make all the difference in your journey going forward as a follower of Jesus. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give a couple of invitations. First, I want to invite you to join us for worship next weekend. Next weekend, we're going to offer seven different ways you can worship at Shoreline. At nine in the morning... There'll be three different worship gatherings indoors. Our first time back indoors since all of the COVID stuff. There'll be three indoors, different kinds. There'll be three services at 11 o'clock or three places outdoors, which will be here, parking lot, and also a family worship venue on the other side of the building here. And there'll be a 9 and 11 online service. So if you're online and you're not able to come back and join us yet, follow us online. So we'll offer all those seven different options. So if you would do this, Go online today. When this service is over, we put a whole new website up, a whole new front page, and there's a place you can click, and it will explain all seven services and how they work. It's like, well, do I wear a mask to this one or that one? There's one, one service we're going to have where you have to have a mask. There's no singing. There's no talking. There's no breathing. No, you can breathe. But, it's, but there's one of the services that will be really protected, and then there's one where people will take their masks off. And don't worry about it. We'll have something for you. There's... On campus things, we have something for everybody. If you would register for a service online, you don't have to register, but if you're going to be on campus in any way, the sooner you register, we can tell how many people are coming. We can be totally set up. If you register, we'll have a safe space for you. You can just walk in and show up, but if you register, we'll have a reserved spot for you. Does that make sense? Also, if you want prayer online, you can uh, respond to the number you see on the screen and let us know you need prayer. And if you're new at Shoreline, this is my last thing. If you're new here, we want to honor you and bless you. So if you're in the courtyard or in the parking lot and you're new, all you got to do is go by the booth back there with the blue and silver balloons, and they want to give you a little gift packet and answer any questions you have and just give you a personal welcome. If you're online, just text the word welcome to the number you see on your screen, and we will follow up with you uh, by answering your questions and making a personal connection with you because we want to be personal with every person, whether you're here or online. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to invite you, if you're able to stand, would you stand in the courtyard? If you're outside your car, feel free to stand. If you're inside, you don't need to. And if you're at home, feel free to stand and just receive this word of blessing as we close our time together. As you go from this place, as you finish your time at home, as you drive out of the parking lot, may you live in the victory of Jesus Christ. May you know his presence and his power and his grace. And may you know that what is yours through faith in Jesus has become his. He has taken your sins. He has taken your shame. He has taken your guilt. He's bored on the cross and he buried it in the deepest sea. It's not yours anymore. 
And will you receive what he gives to you? What's his is yours. His victory, his love, his grace, his glory, his goodness, his strength, his hope, his power. Walk in the resurrection, victorious power of Jesus today and every day. Amen? God bless you. Happy Easter. And we'll see you Wednesday night for night of worship or next Sunday for worship. Have a great day. Happy Easter. God has made us for community. We need each other. We need the joy of fellowship. We need accountability with each other. We need the inspiration we get from one another. And like a sports team, where only one person is trying to do all the work, you never win. We can be inspired, encouraged, fall in love with God, with each other, and then go out to make a difference in the world. We are better together. Being a part of the Food and Pantry team makes me feel great. It just fills me with joy. I, I can't tell you enough how blessed I am. And when we do come together and work together, we feel the love of family, and we feel the support and the joy. And there are people there to laugh with us, to weep with us, to pray with us, to eat with us. And it just, uh, it, it's a community and it's really important. I think we were created to be with community. It's much better to go through motherhood with other mothers in community because that's the way God wants us to live our lives is together in community. I don't have to go through it alone. The small group keeps me attached. The people in it are very caring. We care about them. We pray for each other. Um, when we don't have the small group, I really feel lonely for the group. I miss them. We are made and designed for community. And so getting involved not only benefits those around you, but it really allows you to connect on a deeper level to the Lord. Being on the worship team and a part of the Shoreline community is truly the first time I felt like I fit in and I belong and I have a place that's valued and important. Together, life is better. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we are family. Together, we are better. Together, we are the church.